Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome, and we're just waiting for a couple of minutes extra for, for more people to join. So just bear with us for a couple of minutes. Okay, I think let's get started. Um, good afternoon and welcome everyone to this webinar organized by the South African National Group of uh, IAPSI. My name is Pierre van der Spey. I head up the National Group in South Africa. And um, there's just a couple of things that I want to bring to your attention before I will hand over to my colleague Jan Viem to say a couple of things about um, IAPSI. Uh, this session is being telecasted, um, recorded, and it will be posted on IAPSI social media platforms afterwards. Um, the the Q&A will work as follows. There is a Q&A question button at, at the bottom of the screen. 
you're welcome to post questions while the presentation is, is in, in swing and we will uh, deal with the questions um, afterwards. Uh, just a heads up, uh, in South Africa, we are experiencing a, a energy crisis, electricity crisis. So the power does um, go off from time to time and it, uh, it takes just a couple of moments for the generators um, to come on again. So just don't think that we've, um, we've disappeared, we're still here. Um, just in terms of future webinars that we, we've plan, that we're planning, uh, we are looking at doing a webinar early next year on 3D printed uh, concrete. So please watch out for that and, and join us, register for that, um, for that webinar. Um, then I'm going to hand over to Jan uh, to say a couple of things uh, about IAPC. Thanks, Jan. Thanks, Pierre. Let me just share my screen and you can tell me whether you see the presentation on there. Pierre, is my presentation visible? Yes, yes Jan, we can see it. All right. So good day to everyone. Um, bear with me for a, a short while. I just want to give a short overview of IAPSI and uh, then I will hand back to Pierre in my neck of the woods, it is afternoon now, so a good day to anybody else who sits in another time zone. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with IAPSI, uh, IAPSI's mission is to exchange knowledge and advance uh, the practice of structural engineering worldwide. Now, the real benefit of the IAPSI organization is that uh, it covers all aspects of structural engineering. People often think it is mainly for bridge engineers, but that is definitely not the case. All types of structures are addressed. In, in fact, there are prizes and awards in all categories of types of structures. It also deals with all types of materials and includes members from all sides of the profession coming from the client or the owner, designers, consultants, contractors, suppliers, etc. So as you can see, there are over 3000 members in 100 countries around the world, which makes it a very exciting experience to be part of the, part of the group. One of the real flagship benefits of the organization is the journal Structural Engineering International, which covers often a combination of both academic research, but also practical project uh, articles and papers. So there are also other publications such as the engineering documents, and case studies, which allows uh, capturing of very important information for, for the organization. Most of the work of IAPC, apart from some administrative work, is actually done through the national groups. National groups organize events such as this one. But I must share and advise that my real experience with IAPC has been the international flavor, where one meets uh, people who are like-minded, who are interested in an international forum. Uh, you meet people from right around the world. So I see people here that I've, on these slides that I've known for many years, coming from a wide variety of, of environments. I see uh, people from Japan, India, China, the Czech Republic, uh, Germany, Denmark, Portugal, the US. So uh, the, the real benefit is once you become a member and you start interacting at the international events, uh, that you really become part of the international family of IAPSI and you meet people that are like-minded that are also interested in building relationships across international boundaries. One of the more recent uh, aspects added to IAPSI is the concept of task groups. Now a task group is a small group of um, professionals that come together with a certain aim in mind of fulfilling a, a need in the industry. It can be anything where you, there will be an outcome such as a document or a guideline or a specification. So any member who's got a passion for any specific environment can get together with either one or more other, either members or even non-members to define for themselves a task 
they will be categorized in one of these technical commissions that you see there. And it will be expected that they issue a deliverable within two years or at maximum four years. And that allows people to interact with others and work on a concept which they would like to publish. It can either be a guideline or a specification or a case study or whatever it is. But it normally works out in a deliverable such as some publication. So you saw the, the video coming up, which I'm not going to play. You can go and Google it and, and find information from the young engineer. You will see why I'm I, a member of IAPSI. You're welcome to go and look that up on, on YouTube. As I said, national groups organize events. Every year, there are mainly two large events, one in uh, more or less in September, which is the annual Congress and then one in April or May, which is a small, slightly more specific, specific one, aimed at a specific topic. And this is the international flavor where people get together and share their ideas. The first time you go, you may know very few people, but the more you go there, the more you start interacting and getting to know the others, and then the real benefits start. There are two uh, upcoming events uh, next year, international events. One is the IAPC Symposium in April of next year, which will be in Turkey, um, an exciting destination. Um, so if you are interested in history, exciting structures, meeting people, make sure that you go there. Uh, the annual Congress will be in New Delhi next year in India. Um, there are still possibilities of submit, submitting an abstract I think they've opened it up until the middle of November. So please uh, submit an abstract and, and share in, in the fellowship that you could have in, in Delhi with other like-minded people. There's also at all these large organized uh, events, uh, young engineers programs, uh, and I actually offer reduced membership for, for students. And as you can see on the slide, I'm not gonna go through the uh, number of benefits and nice things to share in and participate in as a young member of IAPSI. On the slide, I see there the top photograph on the left-hand side is Tina Virum. She's from, on the 1st of November, will be the IAPSI president for a, a period of three years. Uh, she was recently, number of, well, not that recent, but also one of the uh, people that were really behind the creation of Young Engineers Program. So uh, feel feel free to, to come to an event and, and meet people like uh, Tina. Here, that is my story. Thank you very much. I will then hand back to you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, I just want to add something about the task groups there. And um, <clears throat> sorry, that is that you don't need to be an academic or have a PhD to be a part of the task groups. Um, it's all about bridging the gap between academia and industry. So feel free. To, to join any of those task groups. You really get to meet people from all over the place. And, <clears throat> and it, <clears throat> sorry. And it's, <clears throat> sorry. And it's very stimulating um, to be part of uh, these task groups. Uh, so I will now introduce our speaker. Uh, Yuan uh, Kutsia is a technical director and bridge expertise leader at Zutari, which is also the company that I happen to work for. Uh, we are a company of about 2,000 people um, working mainly in Africa, but also in, uh, in the Middle East. And we focus on consulting from everything civil, mechanical, chemical, and um, et cetera, and so on. So um, Jan did, uh, sorry, um, Joan did this interesting project uh, in Namibia a, a while ago, um, and it's a it's a very uh, hostile environment um, for a structure, and uh, there's lots of um, lots of damage to it, and and the project is really to was really to rehabilitate um, the structure. So I'm going to hand over to Yuan. Um, thank you, Yuan, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Pierre. Let me just share my screen. Okay. 
Johan, I think you must just put it in presentation yeah. mode. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I'm just sorry, uh, putting the things right. Some of the Zoom buttons that, wasn't in the, in the way. That, that, thank that you, right thank right. you very much. Thank you very much, Pierre. Uh, sorry, so you can see the screen here? Yes, we can. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for everyone for attending. I also want to thank the APSA for this um, opportunity, specifically the South African group. Um, I'll start by just giving the content of, of my presentation. Um, I first of all want to talk about the background to the, to the and it's more about the background, the location, and the environment of this bridge, because to understand the repairs to the bridge, it's, it's important to understand that uh, the location aspect of the bridge. And I'll talk about the existing Maruru River Bridge and, and some background to that, the, the, our assessment uh, and investigation stage, and then the, the design stages from prelim tender detail design. And then lastly, I'll talk about the corro corrosion protective systems or measures that we took to um, protect this, this bridge. The background and location of the bridge is, um, first of all, the location is uh, in Namibia. Um, this is Southern Africa. Uh, Windhoek is the capital of Namibia. And this is on the west coast, just north of the small town of Swakopmund. Uh, this is just a, a, a bigger map of it. You have the town of Swakopmund, the port, the main port for uh, Namibia is Alphys Bay. And then you have the it is Bay north of, of Swakopmund. And uh, there's a town called, called Eus, which, um to the west the inland, and then the bridge is just here close to the coast. This is a, a fairly dry and desert environment. Um, so if one travel on the way to, uh, this is the gravel road going directly to, to Hintis Bay. Uh, one, it's a very interesting landscape, but it's very dry, no rain, uh, very warm. Uh, this is upstream of the Maruru River, the Umdel Dam. Um, that dark line is the highest level that the water ever have been the, in this dam over the years. And um, just to show how uh, dry the environment is. But then the other aspect of, of, of the environment is that along the coast, for I guess about five kilometer strip, it's actually a cold environment, uh, always um, rainy uh, mist that, that comes over from the sea for, for a, a westerly wind that, that blows. And, and, and it, it's, it's about between 12 and 16 degrees Celsius. Um, uh, it's misty and, and uh, which is it's quite in contrast to the, if you just drive slightly away from the coast. The next aspect that's interesting is that um, earlier years, they, they, the road builders had a very interesting way of, or innovative way of, of constructing roads in this area by constructing salt roads. Um, it was fairly economical because the salt pans in the area, the environment, uh, the, the wet environment along the coast helped that, that to keep the, the um, salt moist. And, and they basically spray regularly salt over the road. And it's a very smooth surface. It's also a very dangerous surface in the sense that it, it's very slippery. And this is the road between Swakopmund and Entis Bay about five years ago. And just another photo of the salt road. Uh, initially, if you come there, you won't think it's a salt road. It, it becomes black, uh, like, a, like a tar road. With this environment, then it's, it's a very aggressive environment. And just as a photo of, of a pickup um, track, and, and you'll see that uh, after three years, it's severely corroded. Um, 
under the under the car you can see it's um, all as a lot of corrosion um, and and uh, cars don't last very long in that environment if we go now to the second aspect which is the existing um, Maruru River Bridge. It was a simply supported bridge. The 10 spans of 15 meter. The bearings was uh, laminated elastomeric bearings. Walls, the, the piers consist of wall type piers and uh, pier heads and wall type abutments with return walls. And then you had piles uh, in uh, a very firm, stiff sand. The cross section of the bridge was in situ cast uh, concrete um, beams. Uh, there was one cross beam at the pier, at the pier where the bearings were supported at, at the joints. The history of the bridge in 19, the bridge was constructed in 1980. And um, when we did the prelim design, um, our design was interviewed by Herman Hess, who was employer of, of Namibia Roads Authority at, at, uh, at that stage. And, and he described the existing bridge as, as severely, as that there were severe defects in 1992 when they repaired it the first time. Um, spalling and corrosion of reinforcement. The locations were, were at the deck joints. Um, deck, transverse beam between the decks, also just at the joints. The pier heads, uh, the abutment seating area, uh, at the drainage hole, the wheel holes that drain the deck, and the top of the deck, um, more due to the porous nature of the, the surfacing and, and water increase into the, the surfacing. The chlora, the, the cause was identified at that state as um, chloride attack, and it was like, determined by, by drilling various cores. Uh, cores. The um, combination was, was only minor uh, at, at that stage. And, and chloride was the most severe aspect. They also attributed to the salt road that, that spill, as they spray the salt road, they drive. They don't stop the spray when they stop at the bridge. They, they just drive over and sometimes they don't stop in, in time or they they just spray as they go over the bridge. So he described the repair method in a lot of detail. And, and in summary, it consists of they, they bought the hydro demolishing machine. They then also determined the locations where you had this severe corrosion uh, of reinforcement with uh, of potential uh, cell readings at the 0.5 meter square area at 0.5 meter square areas. And, and they check that over the whole bridge, uh, all the concrete surfaces. Uh, when they started the demolishing, they, they found actually more uh, severe defects as they went along and, and they sometimes had to go 200 millimeters deep. Now that 200 millimeters on the top slab of the deck meant that they actually demolished the whole deck in certain places. Um, the pier head and the deck Hence, um, we, we, it was difficult to, to, to get access to. They um, jacked up the, the, each span, that it, stand, that it was higher than the, the adjacent spans. And then they repaired that portion of the pier head and the end of the, of, of the, the uh, deck uh, in beam, basically. All repairs were done by um, using polymer, um, blend of concrete, uh, uh, they said it was a Sika Kim product with polymer blending and, and uh, plasticizers in it. Um, they replaced all the, ba the parapets at that stage and then the weepers, so they added the down pipes and they also made, the, the, well, it's actually the drainage holes, they made, they increased the, 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 the size and they, um, they add a downpipe to, to extend it to below the deck soffit. There's just a couple of photos of, of the repairs um, or, or the defects that when we were, came there in 2020, uh, 20, or 2015, uh, one can see some on the uh, 
parapets some spalling. Um, it's not very visible in this photo, but but you can see the steel is corroded in this area. And there's a lot of places where there's visible delamination and imminent spalling that will happen. Uh, this is just part of the pier head. Uh, the, the end beam is in this location. Uh, you can see severe spalling on the ground. There was pieces of concrete lying. Um, this was a photo at the abutment. Um, again, one can see where the water is flowing, uh, some elimination of the concrete, rust stains uh, in these locations. The, the beach was, uh, parts of the deck were painted and one could see in the previous picture also the abutment was with, with, the, with the product to, to, to um, improve the durability. Um, and, and there was on the beams and even the tops, the deck slab, this delamination of, of areas that, that still had to spoil. Um, this couldn't really be attributed to leaking of water. It's possibly just areas that, that wasn't good, well repaired, possibly. This is really the, 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 the severe area was between the joints. So the joints were leaking. And 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 uh, this is the location where the pier, the decks was were supported on the bearings, and and one can see the the repaired concrete here, but but it didn't last, um, and there was a lot of uh, steel corrosion in these areas. You can also see on this photo the down pipe they added. Um, although it improved the situation, we always felt that it didn't. You could still see in some of the areas here where, the, where there's some spray of, of water, uh, especially when the wind is blowing, that it did damage the concrete close by. The next stage for us was the assessment investigations. Um, we employed um, a subconsultant, uh, Vinant Lang and Associates, and they helped us with this investigation on site. In, uh, it was actually also in 2015. Uh, the basic investigation testing where we did core drilling to determine carbonation depth, chloride, uh, we determined the chloride content and the compression strength of the concrete. Um, we measured the cover to reinforcement and we did a hammer test uh, throughout, the day, throughout the structure to determine um, the delamination and, and areas where one expects future spoiling of concrete. So the results of this test show that the, the carbonation is very low, similar to the initial investigation, that there was specific location where there was high uh, chloride content. And then the, the compressive strength was a bit of a, of the course was, was a bit of a, um, I want to say like always a confusing result, very low results and very high results. Um, and, and we got the conclusion that compression string is not really an issue. And the cover also seemed well. Uh, that end was 50 millimeters and more in some certain places. So in this investigation, it was clear that, that the areas where water is flowing onto the concrete is the main issue. So at the at the joints, the joints um, last probably five years. So after five years, they were leaking, possible leaking. And, and this, again, between the decks, you had this water flowing onto the deck. So that's why this area was severely spoiled and, and also the pier heads. And, and it also concentrates the water in a specific location. The, the second place where we do find Issues was was at the, the the drainage holes where water really flows onto the the, um, the, the beams and also on the pier head if it's too close to the pier. Um, although they did reduce the problem with the repairs in 1992, and then again same as at the piers at your abutment joint basically is not waterproof and and water leaking onto the, the deck and the abutment. 
We come to then to the next stage was our prelim design. Um, we looked at um, the, the client wanted sidewalks to be added to the bridge. Um, we then looked at three options. We looked at repair, replacing the bridge just completely. And then uh, the second option was, was a purely repairing repair option, similar to the 1992 repairs. And then the option three was, was also repair, but, but we thought of rather replacing certain um, parts or element of the bridge. And that was the bridge decks, the pier head, the um, parts of the Batman seating and the curtain wall. Um, the, the deck, um, we thought of replacing completely and, uh, and, and one of our considerations was, was the, the quality of work to repair those ends of the decks. Um, where there's no space where you have to jack up the, the decks to really get in there and also the pier heads to be able to, to repair that properly with, with the deck in place and all the work around that. Uh, so our conclusion was that option one is, is the most expensive and it was not considered any further, especially because the, the, the substructure from the below the pier heads, so the pier wall columns and the pier uh, pile caps and the piles seem to be in a very good condition with, with actually no defects on them. Now, option two uh, and option three, the cost was very similar when one consider construction and maintenance. Uh, and and um, option two was considered to be the, and option two then obviously as, as was considered to be the most maintenance cost or have the most maintenance cost. For tender design, we um, basically use the same deck as the original design with only adding a, a thin cantilever portion to the deck. So the pier head was also still the same size to accommodate the beams. Um, we added more reinforcement in the in beams. And then the main difference was that, um, but, but we're going to replace the whole, whole deck. Um, and, and then we introduce a couple of things to, to, to ensure that, that uh, better corrosion protection for the, or against the environment. Um, so we, in the joint type, uh, we, we added additional details to ensure that water, that the, the joint is more watertight and can possibly last longer. Um, we add a comprehensive gutter system or drainage system to the bridge. Um, we, uh, on all the new elements, we added um, embedded galvanic panels. Uh, we added waterproofing on top of the deck, which is normally not done in the rest of Southern Africa. Um, and, in, and then galvanize, the, the parapets uh, were galvanized, which is a normal thing that's done in Southern Africa. Um, probably possibly the last 10 years. Uh, we then, detail design then started when the contract was, a, a contractor was appointed and the contractor wanted to change the deck design then to precast beams. And the main motivation was that I had a, a problem with, with uh, delivering concrete to site and, and, and producing large volumes on site. And, and I thought that they can more easily manufacture smaller concrete volumes with, with when they cause construct beams, precast beams. Um, this um, added additional um, load on the deck. And, and um, because we couldn't then add that can, the cantilever portion um, except when we add a special formwork for that, uh, we had to increase the width of the pier heads or the length, probably the length of the pier heads in this direction. Um, and then the precast beams required that we uh, have temporary supports. Um, we, we want to have some temporary supports for them because we want to make the deck continuous and, and we increase the width of the, of the pier heads. We then use this opportunity to see how we can further improve the durability and 
um, we, we change the deck then from a simply supported to a continuous deck, mainly to reduce the number of joints and reduce the number of, of, of water leaking through the deck. Um, other uh, durability considerations is similar to the previous ones, except that we now have the less joints and we also reduce the galvanic anodes. Um, this is just a section of, of the deck cross section with the precast beams, uh, the uh, normal T beams with a thin slab um, forming the T, and then the, um, the in situ slab on top. Um, so when we um, made it um, precast um, beams, um, we provided it and, and we wanted to make it continuous. We uh, provided temporary support in this area with the wider pier head. Um, and we also, uh, at the end of the deck, we uh, made it slightly skewed to have a better um, shear transfer in this, in this area between the deck and in situ concrete. Um, so the deck is, deck is placed in, in, on the temporary support and the in situ portions is cast at the, at the later stage. Um, just the detail that we followed. So there's still protruding through the deck through, from the beams. And this red is really the reinforcement from the, from the second beam. So on this sketch, the red is the one beam's reinforcement protruding and the black is the other beam's reinforcement protruding. So our decision to, to make it um, continuous um, came from the fact that, that um, the durability issue. And then the second issue was we, we were struggling to get the, the precast beams to work. It was a slightly heavier dig. Um, and then we, we basically uh, checked the, the moment envelopes and realized that as soon as we make it continuous, we actually can still make it work with the precast beams because of, of the fact that with the precast, with the, with the simply supported deck, you have um, eccentric loading on the deck and with the, um, with the precast beams and the continuous deck, you have uh, the load is in the center of the pier, although you have larger horizontal loads. And these are horizontal loads we then uh, reduced by um, ensuring that the beams um, were cast as light as, were, were, were placed as light as possible uh, to reduce the shrinkage of the beams. And then it was only the deck and the in situ portions that, that result in, in shrinkage. Um, in, in the this case, COVID actually helped us a bit because it was just some of the time during the, the lockdown period. So, so it gave us a bit more time for the, for the beams to, to, to shrink. Um, we, the, the, continue, the fact that we made it continuous, um, we basically cre <clears throat> so we created a, a model. Um, this is just a sketch to show that we um, consider the piers, the, the, the um, bearings as springs. You have your soil interaction considering to be springs. Um, and, and then we determined the, the, the forces on, on this type of deck. And then we compared it with a continuous deck where we um, had a joint in the center and a joint at the two abutments. And um, we also looked at various stiffnesses for the soil interaction. And we found that it, it, it can work. The, this brings me now to the last portion, uh, the, just a bit more on the protective systems we introduced to, uh, to protect the bridge and hopefully ensure that it lasts longer than the previous repairs. Uh, the first one was the um, galvanic um, anodes that was added. Uh, that was then again on the pier seating beam, the transverse, um, each beams of, of the deck um, and then the deck the, at the deck drainage hole uh, um, square meter around each deck um, drainage hole. 
it was important that it always be tested to ensure that the resistance is less than one ohm. Um, and as I understand it, the, the, the biggest issue of these um, anodes is that the wire is, is if, if the wire is not properly connected to the anode, you have a problem. And if, if there's any in the stream, there's not a good uh, current that can flow between the, the anodes. That's the second issue that will basically make that it doesn't work. In the parapets, we add in the reinforcing enforcement galvanizing. The second um, uh, measure we introduced was in this um, uh, waterproofing of the deck with uh, a bitutine 5,000 material um, to prevent water ingress into the slab from the road. The aspect that I think is probably the most important is to ensure that water don't flow onto the concrete anymore in future. And that is where we introduce the, the drainage pipe or the gutter system. Um, so the, the first, we have a line of, of drainage pipes um, on the outside um, handrail. There's also on the inside, basically drain the sidewalk. And then there's the same on, on next to both um, parapets uh, to drain the, the road surface. So this, these down pipes that you see here, there's a similar row that, that's not in the picture below the, the parapets. So the water basically flows into your uh, pipe and flows to this down pipe, which we, which we made one and a half meters below the deck soft. Then the second issue is the joints, which is uh, also a major issue. There, uh, we drain the water that, that flows onto the seal, also in this, um, to, the, to the pipe system, and, and, and take it away from the bridge. And it's then the, only the three joints that had to be drained like that. But more on the drainage system. Um, we used a metal claw drain, so, so the, the steel parts of it were, were manufactured from 3CR12 steel. Um, the, the standard joint has a compressor rubber seal at the top, um, and we added another seal at the bottom. It's a Cicadier product that, that's, that's fixed with the epoxy. Uh, that's basically just folded. I mean, it's basically a rubber membrane, membrane that is just folded like this to collect water. Should should it should there be any leaks here? Um, and then the idea is that it, it drains to the side with the slope of the deck, and then it drains into a, a pipe system on the side of the deck. Uh, then the the last um, measure we took was to, to add a um, cementitious flexible uh, fiber reinforced mortar um, that, that's painted on, on all over the, the um, on all the concrete surfaces. And this is just a, um, a video that I can just um, show just um, uh, you can see they the, the pay some of the between surface or the, the waterproofing, but they're really painting these all the concrete surfaces. And then, of course, below the deck, they also painted all the surfaces. In this video, you can also see then there's just the uh, one joint in the center of the deck and then at the abutments. Um, you can also see in this picture the landscape that's really a desert like landscape, and also the fact that it's overcast. Um, and thank you very much. That's if there's any questions, uh, Pierre. Over to you. Thank you, Jan, for that interesting presentation. Uh, we don't have questions in the, in the box, but uh, do we have any questions from the floor? Anyone's welcome to, to, to ask. Yeah, can I raise, uh, uh, raise a question? Of course. Yeah, Johan, thanks for the presentation. I just was sitting here wondering about uh, 
the contractors' capabilities and uh, whether they also in Namibia have, have requirements in terms of um, making use of local labor. Uh, how far away is that, and how do you experience? Did you experience the skills that they've got available? So the the contractor. Um, so there's a couple of aspects to that. The the contractor is the the actually the. Um, I think they belong to the, the, the it's, it's the roads authority contracting um, part of the contract, but they, they employed a, a separate uh, subcontractor to, to do the work. And that was uh, a Chinese contractor actually. And then the, um, I think the, the biggest issue there would be not the labor, but it's the, the materials, so your steel is imported from South Africa. Um, the concrete they make there, but the cement, some of the cement comes from Namibia, some come from South Africa. Um, these products, they have local offices for any product you want to use, but, but it's mostly imported and the galvanic anodes were also imported. The bridge joints were also imported. Um, uh, but I guess the skills um, is, is, is probably the same as, as in South Africa, I would, I would think, of the, of the local people, of the people doing the work here. Um, were they, uh, sorry, we've got, we've got two questions. Um, Natalie's asking, uh, did you consider the use of flexible plug joints? Um, and she says, I'm assuming the movement range was outside their capability, but they could have created a greater level of seal than a nosing joint. Okay, um, so when we, when we initially for the tender design had um, the simply supported deck, it was, uh, that specifies asphaltic plug joints, except that we also added that membrane at the bottom because we, um, I believe a asphaltic plug joint is actually less, um, it, it is porous. So, so the asphaltic itself has a, um, it, uh, it's just a top layer that seals seal it in the end. So we still add that, that uh, membrane at the bottom, but yes. And then the second problem was because we made it now continuous, the movement was just too much um, for asphaltic plug joint, especially in the center, we just have, basically have double the movement from the abutment. And then uh, Franz Kromert asks whether you considered um, any form of uh, waterproofing admixtures in the concrete rather than an external application of a membrane. Yes, we did consider it initially, but um, the, the feeling was that, that uh, we must just ensure that we have good quality concrete. Yeah. Um, and may I ask, so was the client specific as to how much, you know, how many additional years they want out of the structure? No, no, that, that was not, uh, um, specific requirement, but I ex we expect that they, they believe that bridge will now last again for the for yeah. full design life of 100 years. And, and is there any specific maintenance schedule or, or does the design, so, the design provides for, for the durability, I guess? So, so I think that the biggest issue and, and, and to come back to the concrete um, question also the First of all, I just want to con so so the main the, the fact that we painted the, the the concrete in the end was really just an additional measure to ensure that the safe the safety of or, or the durability of the bridge. The main issue of this type of, of defect, um, what what we saw was that that you need to keep keep water away from concentrating on points on the bridge. So so the the biggest issue here for me is the drainage system that you need to that need to be in place always. So they still constructing the, um, the road from this bridge up to Uis, Uis, uh, I think one pronounce it Uis, um, 
but um, what I understand from the people from site there, the RDI road director or roads authority um, maintenance teams were on site. They went through the bridge um, and, and explaining why the drainage pipes needs to be ensured that it's always clean and open. And um, mm. so, so, so that's where it, it's at the moment. I must mention that the, they do actually quite good maintenance uh, the, the Namibian Roads Authority on, on their structures and on their roads. And one can see it when you drive through Namibia, it's, it's really well done. Mm. What, what is the length of the bridge? Uh, it's 150 meters. And, and split into two? Yes, we, split it into two. we initially started with uh, with eliminating all the joints except the, at the abutments. Um, but I think we, um, we then realized at the point we were trying too much by doing that and, and we decided we have to have a, point, a joint in the center. Okay, okay. Um, any other, we don't have any other questions on the, in the Q&A box. Um, any, anyone else, you're welcome to, to ask a question. Okay. Seems that we don't have further questions. So um, thank you very much, Johan, for your presentation. Um, and I think well done. It's a really, uh, I would say, aesthetically pleasing structure, especially in its environment. Um, right, okay. Thank you very um, much, Pierre. And uh, so also just thank you to uh, Brinda and uh, Firat from IAPC for um, organizing this webinar. They do all the admin uh, in the background and do all the marketing and so on for us. So thank you very much for that. Okay, so if there's no further questions, we can, um, we can then close this webinar. Thank you, bye. Thank you, thank you goodbye. Everyone. Goodbye.